Good morning. My name is Vince Gaudiani, and we're here at California Pacific Medical Center. And we're going to do some cardiac surgery this morning, in fact, some valve surgery. And uh, we want to provide you with some basic information about valve surgery that may make it easier for you or for your family member to undergo an operation. Now, um, in what follows, there'll be a discussion about how the heart works and about how valves work inside the heart that is the basis of a discussion, a much more intimate discussion that you have to have with whoever is caring for you because the details of your particular situation or that of your family member uh, may be very different from uh, the, the generalities that I'm going to provide you with here. But we wanted to provide this video for you because it'll give you a sense of what I call a smell of battle, you know, what it's like to do cardiac operations in a, in a real environment. And so I'm going to take the next 20 minutes or so, or 10 minutes, and explain um, uh, how the heart works and how the valves in the heart work. And then we'll introduce you around the room a little bit so you'll have a sense of uh, what, a, what the world of cardiac surgery is like. This beautiful organ sits in the middle of your chest about like this, and it weighs a pound. And it's two pumps, each working independently, but pumping precisely the same amount of blood each minute. And believe it or not, each of these pumps in an average sized person will pump 1,500 gallons a day. So that means that 1,500 gallons in a 24 hour period come into the right pump. The right pump pumps it to your lungs. The lungs oxygenate the blood and return it to the left pump. And then the left pump takes that blood and under quite a bit higher pressure, about five times as high a pressure as the right pump, the left pump takes it and drives it all the way through your body. It goes into every part of you that's alive, and of course that's all parts of you, and delivers oxygen at the capillary level. And then the blood passes into veins, has just enough energy to fall back into the right pump whence it's once again pumped to the lungs. Now you have about a gallon and a quarter of blood in you, about five quarts. And so therefore, um, in the course of a 24-hour period, your heart will uh, pump your blood about 1,000 or 1,200 times. Um, and in the, in the same period of time, um, just to take a single example, your brain will get 400 gallons of blood flow. So it's an enormous task that your heart performs. And in order to perform it, it would have to have one-way valves in it to prevent sloshing if you know what I mean. We'll, we'll try to describe it as follows. Look at, the, look at the inside. This is just an artist model, by the way. It's not really accurate, but as blood comes back from your veins to go to the lungs to get oxygen, there's a one-way inlet valve that lets blood into the heart, but then prevents it from going out backwards. This is the tricuspid valve. And there's a one-way outlet valve right here that lets blood out to go to the lungs, but then doesn't let the blood fall back in. These are one-way passive flap valves and the purpose of them is to make sure the flow of blood is in one direction only. Then, once the blood comes back from the lungs, which of course are cut off on this model, it encounters the left side of the heart, left atrium and left ventricle. Before we were looking at the right atrium and the right ventricle. But when it comes back from the lungs, it encounters the left atrium and the left ventricle. And you can see that it enters through the mitral valve and then exits through the aortic valve. In this way, out this way, one-way passive flap valves that work by changes of pressure in the heart. The valves don't know what's going on. They open when the pressures are correct and, and close when the pressures are correct within the heart. And they do that just by the way the heart moves the, these uh, flexible structures called valves. Now, while the valves on the right side of the heart are called tricuspid and pulmonary valves, the valves on the left side are called mitral and aortic valves. And I'll show you a little bit better example of an aortic valve in just a minute, an aortic pig valve. But for the moment, the important idea is that these are one-way passive flap valves. And the purpose of them is to make sure the flow of blood is in one direction only. Now, the names aren't too important, and you know, as, as you know from other aspects of medicine, names are very confusing and everything has three names. So there are many valves that have three cusps that are not called the tricuspid valve. So don't worry about that. Just concentrate, if you want to learn about this, on the way they work. The other thing that's important to know about this is that since the pressure in the left pump is five times as high as the pressure in the right pump, guess what? For every one right-sided valve that gets in trouble, 10 left-sided valves do because they're under so much more load. 
So the common things that go wrong with these valves are some people are born with a floppy or stretched out uh, mitral valve. The tissue is pretty good, but it, the valve isn't disposed correctly within the, within the atrium, and therefore they get what's called mitral valve prolapse. Um, and the valve, over time, over years, comes to leak. And a certain number of people with mitral valve prolapse have enough of a leak to require a cardiac operation. In the vast majority of the cases of mitral valve prolapse, just to take it as the first example, the valve can be repaired by a variety of techniques. And we'll talk about those perhaps uh, toward the end of this discussion. Uh, there are other more uh, uh, complex uh, disorders of the mitral valve that are caused by disease states. For instance, rheumatic fever was common in the 50s in the United States and is still common in third world countries. Uh, but now rheumatic fever is rarely seen in uh, people who are born in the first world, if you will, in the richer world, because it, uh, rheumatic fever is um, caused by um, an organism that uh, doesn't persist much in, the fir in first world countries anymore. The most common disorder, however, that is, uh, occurs in uh, people of all ages is uh, a gradual narrowing of the aortic valve called aortic stenosis. Stenosis means uh, narrowing of. And the aortic valve is a and I'm going to just show you one here for a minute that's an, a, the valve of a pig that we use to replace an aortic valve with, but it looks a lot like a human valve. And it's not only a good example of what a uh, valve looks like that's a replacement valve, but it's not a bad example of what your own valve looks like. And this white housing around the outside, of course, is man-made, but the um, three yellowish leaflets that you see here are precisely what yours look like if you have a healthy aortic valve, or pretty darn close. So when the heart squeezes, blood comes through it this way, easily, and you can see these leaflets get out of the way because they're very flexible. And then between beats, when the heart is relaxing, these things close down. If this valve becomes stiffened by calcium or by age, gradually this hole narrows and less and less blood can get through, or to drive the same amount of blood through requires a much greater effort by the heart. And so gradually, the heart, this muscle, has to work harder and harder to drive blood through a hole that won't open. And it thickens and stiffens and doesn't work as well. And when that gets serious enough, um, patients may require this valve to be removed and another one to be sewn in. And there are a variety of replacement valves that are available, some of which, like this, are called tissue valves because they're made out of the tissue of a species not all that dissimilar from us, usually either cows or pigs. Uh, turned out to be the most useful material to use for making uh, this structure.